Ladies and gentlemen, indeed uh, the European institutional setup might be complicated, but I invite everyone to try to study the complexities of the Federal Reserve System, and then they will see that <laughs> we do our best. Uh, on the other hand, uh, let me tell you how I feel it quite natural, coming from a country, and especially a city of Luxembourg, to feel quite homely when I come to Krakow, because anyone who has been traveling to the fairy tale city of Luxembourg would see uh, that it is quite close uh, to the medieval charm that you find in Krakow. And that at least was uh, the spell I had when I first came to this city around 30 years ago. And uh, I can only tell the people of the, the organizers of Aspire that uh, I greatly admire Aspire for the contribution to the huge economic development that is going on. And I think this is also a real witness uh, of the benefits uh, of a broad economic area, the European Union, that shares not only economic values, but that also shares political values. And uh, from that point of view, it is really a great, great pleasure to uh, share with you some thoughts on European integration today. I last read the book which said uh, that the world is flat by Thomas Friedman. So I would have suggested that you invite Thomas Friedman to <laughs> this conference. But uh, since I will talk about European integration, I agree with his slogan. This is uh, European integration, I mean, is obviously a topic of uh, interest to me as a European central banker, but in fact, I would say it's also very relevant for you as well, given the important and active role that uh, many of you play in this what I would consider very dynamic part of Europe. As representatives of leading investors and corporations, as providers of technology and know-how, you play an essential part in promoting growth, employment and prosperity in Europe. Even if you have just heard an interesting conference about how to destroy jobs and replace it by automation. The 1st of May this year, exactly two weeks ago, was more than just Labor Day. It was the 10th anniversary of the accession of no fewer than 10 countries to the European Union. Three more countries, Bulgaria, Romania, and most recently Croatia, have since joined. The European Union, despite its shortcomings, remains, I think, respected and influential. It also remains an aspiration for non-members, and maybe even in other ways, an inspiration. The Union has been, and in my opinion continues to be, a successful integration and undertaking. It has become a role model for regional cooperation. It has achieved the, its original objectives, namely to ensure, first of all, peace and prosperity in a notoriously conflict-ridden part of the world. It has also enlarged and deepened European integration and throughout its almost now 60 years history, the EU has shown its ability to overcome important economic, but also important political challenges. In fact, the Euro area, the most integrated part of the Union, has grown since 99 and the number of member states continues to increase despite the challenges and sometimes the setbacks of the recent crisis, we have started out with 11 countries. We have expanded over the years, and now we comprise 18. 
Most of them have experienced a slow but steady improvement in their economies with steady growth of per capita income. The number of countries having recently reset a target date for euro area accession is a witness of unabated attraction of our common project, subject to the agreed convergence and subject also obviously to the established criteria that have been imposed on all the countries, the founding countries and also those who exceeded later on. And that is what I call also the rule of law, equal treatment of all the countries when they join one further stage in the integration. In many ways, EU membership and the prospect of Euro adoption provided an impetus for reforms in these countries and contributed to the implementation of stability-oriented macroeconomic policies. EU accession has also helped in the development of stronger institutions and very broadly also a more business-friendly environment. Last but not least, EU funds on a significant scale have been invested in these countries, bringing noticeable improvements to the transport infrastructure. And I can tell you, I saw the difference when I came here 30 years ago, and when I flew in into the city yesterday evening, it was quite impressive. Even coming from a country like Germany with a city like Frankfurt, I think you are in terms of modernity of infrastructure way ahead. True, this process has not always been easy, but overall these have been 10 successful years since those countries acceded. Poland is an example in case. It has grown strongly over this period and been remarkably resilient to the global financial crisis. It was, in fact, the only European Union country, the only one whose GDP in 2009 did not fall after the onset of the global recession in 2008. The country's per capita income jumped from around 45% of euro area average back 10 years ago, 2003, to 65% of euro area average in 2013. Therefore, in my comments today, I will stress the importance of the sustainable convergence of Europe's economies and why the different levels of integration between them call for a greater degree of commitment and also, I would underline, a greater degree of mutual trust. On the subject of European integration, what exactly is required of an EU member state? The answer was provided at the time of the previous enlargement process in the 90s, and I'm referring here to the so-called Copenhagen criteria, of which there are three. The first one of this criteria is the political criterion, which today underlines its crucial importance. It means a candidate country must have stable institutions which guarantee democracy. Then there is a second Copenhagen criterion, which is an economic one. A country must have a functioning market economy. And finally, the third criterion concerns the adoption of the so-called acquis communautaire, the body, the adoption of the body of European laws. In other words, a candidate country must be able to take on and implement all the obligations of EU membership, including adherence to the aims of political, economic and monetary integration. What about the Euro adoption? Joining the EU is only the beginning of the monetary integration process. As so-called member states with a derogation following European Union accession, countries are committed 
committed to preparing for their eventual adoption of the euro. Hence, the pursuit of macroeconomic stability, sound government finances and the monetary policy geared towards price stability, which ought to be those countries' objective. But the experience of member states over the past 10 years shows that there is no single path leading to Euro adoption. Countries can follow different paths towards the Euro and also different speeds. In fact, while some countries have already joined the Euro area, a few others have not even specified a target date for the joining. Although since the eruption of uh, more difficult geopolitical tensions, uh, we have seen that some countries are rushing to reset their target date and uh, trying to push for much faster adoption of the euro. Adopting the euro, as I said, is a treaty obligation. But at the same time, it must also be a political ambition of a member country. Moreover, the different paths being followed by different countries may also reflect the varying degrees of convergence of their economies, because you cannot join a monetary union if your economy is not set on a stable converging path, otherwise uh, it would be too harsh to have uh, permanent uh, real adjustments in the real economy side uh, since uh, external devaluation path is uh, excluded. The drafters of the treaty realized that successful monetary integration can only be ensured once a high degree of sustainable economic convergence has been achieved. That is why they drew up the so-called Maastricht criteria which are on top, of course, of the Con uh, Copenhagen criteria. These Maastricht criteria are the macroeconomic indicators which have been set up to measure price stability, to measure the soundness and the sustainability of public finances, but also exchange rate stability and long-term interest rate convergence. Countries may only adopt the euro and are expected to do so once these criteria have been sustainably met. One element of these convergence criteria is the exchange rate mechanism, the so-called ERM2, which a prospective euro area country must join. The mechanism is a multilateral arrangement of fixed but adjustable exchange rates with a central rate against the euro on which we add a standard fluctuation bank band of plus or minus 15 percentage. As such, it is consistent with the regional integration process in which all member states are deeply involved. Their macroeconomic policies must be coherent if they are to successfully participate in this exchange rate mechanism. The convergence criteria form a coherent package that is neither negotiable nor subject to change since these criteria are enshrined in the treaties which have been adopted by constitutional majorities in all member countries. From a legal viewpoint, this ensures continuity, but it also ensures equal treatment of all the countries. And from an economic point of view, the logic of lasting convergence has obviously also not changed. The adoption of the euro is a strategic goal of all Central and Eastern European member states which includes Poland, obviously. However, joining the euro area should not be seen as an end in itself. The euro provides a notably higher degree of economic integration and stability, but it also calls for a permanent 
stronger commitment and a greater degree of mutual trust and responsibility. It is in each country's own interest, as well as in the interest of the Euro area as a whole. As the past few years of economic and monetary union have shown, temporary fulfillment of these convergence criteria does not by itself guarantee trouble-free membership of the Euro area. And disregarding the rules of the game equally does not guarantee trouble-free membership. Large and persistent macroeconomic imbalances accumulated in several Euro areas and were partly to blame for the economic and financial crisis which broke out in 2008, but certainly fully to blame for the spillover and rapid contagion of this crisis in the weakest part of the Euro area. In some countries, high public spending since the adoption of the Euro has resulted in extremely high public deficits and an unsustainable accumulation of public debt. Other countries have, however, experienced excessive growth of private debt based on buoyant capital imports and low interest rates. This has resulted in surging imports and large current account deficits rather than the strong trend potential growth and in some instances, excessive credit growth closely associated with an unsustainable boom in real estate markets has undermined the soundness of some financial institutions and give rise to an excessive accumulation of private debt. While the cause of the crisis varied in the countries affected, the imbalances obviously had to be corrected. There was simply no alternative to fiscal consolidation. There was no alternative to repair and restructuring of financial institutions. And there is no alternative to structural reforms to restore sound fiscal positions and competitiveness and to improve flexibilities of product and labor markets. The challenges we are facing are obviously not exclusive to the euro area. In your capacity as business professionals, consultants or investors, you are all aware that many EU member states are lagging behind in new technologies and know-how. In many countries, policies need to be supported which foster innovation and upward mobility on the technological ladder which make employment protection legislation more flexible and which focus on training and human capital formation and which give priority to efficient government expenditure. I believe these are policies of great relevance to this conference as well. The EU has learned its lessons. We know now what did not work properly. We have all realized that there needs to be a stronger set of institutions and a stronger set of rules to support a common single currency. That a monetary union needs to be accompanied by a banking union and a fiscal union. And that finally, on top in the end, economic integration and political integration in Europe have to go hand in hand. Needless to say, such a degree of integration requires a stronger permanent commitment, political commitment by all the countries involved. The consequences of the crisis are still holding back growth and job creation and could even do so for quite some time. Even if we have the beginning of economic recovery, this could very well be that there is a certain lag because before the job figures uh, are catching up. But the Euro area will return to being a region of prosperity and job creation. And it, certainly it is an area of stability. I would even 
together with what President Draghi said, call it an island of stability. But such an area of stability is not a matter of course. It needs to be maintained and strengthened. It requires continuous efforts by national authorities. Fiscal consolidation needs to continue. Sufficient public buffers must be created to ensure that the social costs of future adverse shocks can be cushioned. Labor markets must be flexible enough to allow the economy to adjust to adverse events. Product and service markets need to be accelerated in the reform effort. Closed regulated professions and over-regulated sectors have to be liberalized. And as regards financial sector policies, countries need to ensure a sound financial system to facilitate access to funding for the real economy and especially for small and medium-sized companies. But to remain in the area of stability also requires a stronger framework of fiscal and macroeconomic surveillance and monitoring. As a result, the, the system of surveillance that is applicable to countries that have joined the euro area is significantly tougher than that that is applicable to countries that are only in the process of seeking to adopt the euro. Because once you join the euro, you have lost some tools of economic adjustment uh, that is only available if you have a national currency. In the aftermath of the euro area crisis for countries that have already adopted the euro, the so-called convergence criteria have been reinforced. For instance, the fiscal governance framework under the Stability and Growth Pact, which seeks to prevent and to correct excessive deficits and also to correct excessive debt levels of governments has been further strengthened. The macroeconomic imbalance procedure, so-called MIP, which has been in place since 2011, aims to correct or prevent harmful macroeconomic imbalances which could jeopardize the proper functioning of the economic and monetary union. Both these frameworks, macroeconomic imbalances, stability and growth back to avoid fiscal imbalances, have been integrated into the European Union's broader cycle of economic policy guidance and surveillance, which are called the European semester. But let me add also a few words on Poland. The country has made impressive progress in recent years in terms of convergence. Incomes have been rising rapidly to euro area averages, while at the same time inflation has remained subdued both this year and last at around 0.6%. Long-term interest rates have remained relatively low at around 4%. But it's not all plain sailing. On the fiscal side, although the general government gross debt to GDP ratio has been rising and is now close to 60%, well, it still stands below the 60% Maastricht reference value. But it's close to the national debt ceiling value. The government deficit is still well above the 3% reference value and might not even be able to be in line with what had been projected. As a result of this excessive deficit, Poland is currently subject to an European Union Council decision of excessive uh, deficit and must ensure that there is a sustainable reduction and correction by 2015. Also, the Polish Lotti is not yet participating in ERM2, but trading under a flexible exchange rate regime. Last but not least, Polish law must still be adopted to meet all the legal requirements for 
euro area membership. Notably, central bank independence, the confidentiality regime, the monetary financing prohibition, and the legal integration into the euro system. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. More than 55 years ago, Europe's political leaders recognized that they needed to agree on policies to ensure a future of peace and stability, and to bring the nations of Europe ever more closely together. Their insight has been a very powerful force, considering the remarkable achievements since then, notably the stability achieved in and by the Union as a whole. But although stability may prevail inside the Union, the situation is quite different at our borders. We live in an unpredictable region with fragile borders set in a turbulent world. Current developments painfully remind us the words of Robert Schuman, whose anniversary of the Paris Declaration, which set the start for the first step of European integration with coal and steel union, this declaration, which is also a holiday for the European institution, but that's not the only reason why I remember that day of the Paris Declaration. Uh, I also remember it because Robert Schuban has been one of my great-great-great-grand-uncles. He said, world peace cannot be safeguarded without the making of creative efforts which are proportionate to the dangers which threaten it. We see the dangers which threaten us. It should spur us to do the necessary efforts and sacrifices to move closer together. It means going beyond the economic foundations of the European project. In today's highly interconnected and competitive world, it means thinking beyond national economic interests and instead exploiting synergies and comparative advantages together. In short, it means working together to hold our own. Of course, I'm referring to very closely linked political and economic forces. The lessons of history tell us that political objectives require sound economic foundations. And this is where I come back in as a central banker. Our role as central bankers is to support wider economic and policy objectives by creating the monetary conditions that favor prolonged non-inflationary, and let me add, obviously also non-deflationary economic growth. Only in this way can we help to maintain the euro area as a region of prosperity, job creation, and growth. In other words, a region of stability to which we aspire. Thank you for your attention. Maybe one question which is probably repeated from times to times, but I just want to hear the answer from your side. Uh, we always hear that this, there are skepticisms uh, around introducing euro as a common currency and replacing the local currency of the country because of its uh, actually depriving the country of some tools to mitigate the crisis. And this is the major opinion of the ones who do not want to do it. How would you answer to those people? I think as long as uh, you have a national currency, you should try to use it as a means to speed up convergence and not to protect the country against the uh, influence of competition or the influence uh, of uh, working together in a wider economic area. But once you are comfortable that you have uh, reached a speed of integration, of economic convergence, with which you feel comfortable to be able to compete within the set of other European uh, advanced economies, 
I think uh, you should not use your currency anymore as a tool to get uh, comparative advantages uh, through this means. Anyway, this would be forbidden already under the normal treaty of economic uh, cooperation inside the European Union. But each country has to decide by itself when it is ready to give up this instrument of macroeconomic policy making and enjoy the common currency, which also implies a higher degree of discipline in the area of macroeconomic policies, in the area of uh, public finance, and in the area of structural finances, of structural reforms. It also means that you must be confident enough to accept that your peers of other countries look over your shoulder and assess whether you do the necessary job at home. But on the other hand, you participate yourself also in assessing your neighbors' economic policy, public finance policy, structural reform policy. And you participate in the decision-making of a currency which in the meantime has become a world-recognized currency. So there are advantages which are quite clear, but the price to achieve these advantages and to benefit from it is also quite clear. It is up to the authorities of each country to assess when the time has come. But I think it should be clear that they have already underwritten the goal of joining the Euro. That must be quite clear. And I also said the Euro is a little bit more than just an economic prospect, an economic tool of policy making. The Euro is part of a common belief, of common values, of a solidarity of standing together. That should not be forgotten. I'd like to ask you about your opinion on alternative currencies, um, because around the world now we see experimenting in private currencies. And when the 85 richest people in the world control as much wealth as half of the world's population, uh, I'm predicting in the next 20 years the rich will have their own currency, which would be independent of not only European Union or even nation state. Uh, so, what is the EU's view on uh, private currencies? I cannot give you the EU's view, I can only speak for the ECB. We are in charge of uh, the common currency, which is a currency of 325 million people. And we have a mandate to preserve the stability of this currency, both internally and externally. We very closely monitor developments in these uh, areas of private initiative uh, where there is uh, no legal impediment uh, to try to develop such initiatives which are purely based on contractual law. But obviously there is no one backing such currencies. There is no lender of last resort. There is no one trying to regulate those currencies. So, so the ones who deal with those currencies do it at their own peril and at their own risk. Now, uh, we see that the overall use of this currency is extremely small compared to the use of official currency. It represents less than 1% in the overall number of financial transactions and even less so in the overall number, volume of financial transactions. So from that point of view, I would not see an immediate uh, threat to uh, or competition between private and public currencies. But this does not mean that uh, we do not monitor the situation. We see the rapid increase, also the pace of increase, but we also see the setbacks. As to the question of uh, the distribution of wealth, I think you also have a point, and there have been recent uh, 
literature also published on this matter. Uh, it is obvious that uh, during the crisis uh, these uh, concerns uh, have probably also increased. But this is rather a question for the politically accountable uh, authorities to respond rather than for a central banker. Scott Newman from State Street Bank. I have to take the opportunity to ask a topical question. The ECB has said recently that it's prepared to take conventional or unconventional means to address the current period of, of low inflation, high employment, and, and one suggestion uh, that is out there is the use of negative interest rates in the Eurozone. I'd just like to ask your, your view on how you believe that will address the, the, the current uh, uh, issue and um, whether you would see it as a, a purely a, a temporary measure. It obviously, if you refer to negative interest rates, uh, it's obviously not a normal measure. It's an extraordinary measure which is uh, appropriate uh, in extraordinary circumstances to address uh, uh, the situation as uh, we see it. But uh, we have said since many months that this is a tool that is available and that we invited the whole industry to get prepared as we were preparing ourselves inside um, to go into that direction. I have myself said several times publicly that it is uncharted territory and uh, that there might be unintended consequences. But uh, we have had now uh, several months, if not years, to prepare for it, and um, I would say it is certainly today a tool that is on the shelf. And uh, if the Governing Council deems it appropriate to use this tool in view of the circumstances and in view of its assessment of its efficiency, it is certainly a tool that is available. Now, uh, the question arises, uh, what is the ultimate efficiency of uh, a small venturing into that territory, not of the main monetary uh, refinancing operations, but uh, of the deposit facility. That uh, is a question that has to be assessed by the governing council, uh, but that is also the reason why we are also looking at other instruments and in the end, uh, the Governing Council will take a decision which will be based on its assessment on the needs uh, that it detects uh, that needs to be covered. And I can tell you personally, the first need that we address is the one of the credit allocation to the European economies. We see that after the crisis, um, we have some signals of a nascent rise in the demand side for credit and we want to make sure that this demand side is not constrained by supply side factors. And how we address this issue will be one which will decide which instruments we will use. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mersch.